this is our inaugural uh, event where we talk to some of our members that have, uh, in addition to written a lot of reviews of films or, or TV shows or interviewed a lot of celebrities in their career uh, or roundup pieces uh, as entertainment journalists and critics, uh, they've also written a book or more. And our guests in this first edition of the uh, Gallica Authors Club uh, Zoom Meetup is, uh, well, we have two guests, uh, Kristen Lopez, who is the author of, I believe, her first book. That's amazing. Uh, but have you read the book, 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Films? And it's, uh, it's under the Turner Classic Movies imprint, which is interesting. And then we also have, uh, also, oh, by the way, I should say, Kristen is uh, the new film editor at The Wrap after uh, years at IndieWire. And then we have Michael Schulman, who is the, uh, an esteemed staffer at The New Yorker and uh, is apparently an Oscar uh, expert. And he has written A History of Hollywood in Gold, Sweat and Tears, Oscar Wars. Um, and he is a New York Times bestselling author, and we want to hear a little bit about that, too, about uh, his previous efforts. Uh, but first, we're going to talk with uh, Kristen. I should say that, you know, uh, books based on movies have won a lot of Oscars. So, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I was looking through the, the years of Oscar winners, and uh, Michael can probably riff on this in a little bit. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it just seems like a ton of, well, we all know every, everything from, or books by Dickens to Fitzgerald to um, Austin to, um, well, you get the picture, uh, War and Peace. Uh, a lot of movies have been based on books, obviously, and a lot of have been, have gone on to win Oscars. Um, Kristen, what, just generally tell me a little bit about uh, what you were like as a kid uh, or a teen that relates to this book. Why is this book your first book, and and what is the passion there? I I, I hate the the term book nerd, but I imagine you read a lot as a child or as a teen. Yeah, I mean, I was always the kid that my father would get very annoyed before Kindles were a thing that I would have a physical book on me anywhere we went, whether we went to the grocery store, whether we were going to the gas station. Like I always had. A physical book on my person because there was never a bad time to read I would bring I was the one that would bring books to parties uh and just be like they're like a room I can hang out at or I'd go and like hang out in my friends rooms just to see what books they had uh and if I could like so I was yes I was very much a book nerd um I got my master's in English uh re so required a lot of reading uh and ironically when I got pitched the idea to write this the the question from TCM was you have a master's in English so do you read a lot and I was like well it is the first time this this degree of mine is actually paid off uh, so so wow. yeah I mean that's great I, yeah so I mean I I always was the one that would I liked being spoiled so I would read the books before the movies came out so that I like knew ahead of time what I was expecting so this was very much in my wheelhouse when they were like, do you want to write about film adaptations? I'm like, do I? I mean, I, I, I'm the one that always was doing that and making sure I was spoiled, uh, you know, and then usually would complain about how they took something out of a book or they added something in. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was always in my wheelhouse. So how did uh, uh, the Turner Classic Movies, Classic Movies people, uh, find you or think of you had they read that we we, we know that you you have uh, uh podcasts and blogs and you're you're a cineast and you love hollywood history i guess you had some fans there yeah i mean i've i it's insane that i get to say that i've worked with tcm before you know i was a social uh social producer which is kind of like an influencer when they did their film festival for a couple years um you know they were the first film festival i ever got like media creds for I felt very fancy um you know I wrote I freelanced for them and wrote for their their website uh, a bunch you know so I've always been you know around they they know me uh by by name and by face which is really cool um but my my co-worker at IndieWire Christian Blavelt had written a book for TCM um 
And I had kind of just asked him in passing, like, hey, how, how does one do that? Um, he was like, well, you know, let me put you in touch with the guy that does books. So reminder that unfortunately it is who you know in some instances. So in, in my case, you know, I knew Christian, he put me in touch with, with TCM and TCM already had kind of a list of ideas that they, they were already sold. Essentially, I just had to sell myself as the person that could write it. So, so it was far easier than it is to actually sell a book sight unseen, which I'm now learning trying to sell a second book. You know, uh, the TCM kind of spoils you for how, how simplistic the process is because it is not at all the same uh, Interesting. Otherwise. So, so you didn't have to put together a book proposal necessarily. I did. Market I, did. Um, I did because they they essentially needed. I needed to prove that I could do it. So I did have to do a book proposal, like a one page kind of saying why this book was significant, um, why I thought I could do it, and I did have to do a sample table of contents in two sample chapters. Um, one of the sample chapters ended up making it into the book. The other one I unfortunately could not include because I had far too many mystery detective books. Uh, so they told me we already have too many. Dennis Lehane's going to have to wait. So unfortunately, I'm, my deepest apologies to Mystic River. I tried very hard to get it in, but uh, it did help sell this book. So it, it, it made itself known. Did you have to, or did they discuss with you other books that, um, are similar or was this something that somebody decided, wow, this hasn't been done before? You know, we talked about, I, I'm sure that there are adaptation, you know, academic tomes, you know, this was something they said that they wanted to definitely sell people on the idea of reading as opposed to not just watching the movie. So, um, you know, I, I definitely wanted to make it not necessarily academic in terms of like deconstructing why somebody made those choices, but also selling, you know, why the book is at least worth reading, even if it's not good. Uh, there's a couple couple books I included in here that I do not care for the book, but I did make the argument on why you should still read it and why, why certainly the movie is good. Um, you know, they they talked a lot in terms of like some of their other books that they've done um, you know, Christian's book on, on New York and the movies and, you know, Leonard Malton books that he's done. So I, I definitely felt like the bar was set very high. I'm like, when you're comparing this book to something like that Leonard Malton or Roger Ebert would write, I'm like, that puts a lot of pressure on me because I know I am not nearly as good a writer as, as those two. Um, but the goal was really, they said, you know, not to, to sell people on the idea of not just watching the movie, but going back to the source material and actually wanting to read it. Now, they must have done this with some sort of market research themselves or knowing their uh, people that would buy the book. They're, they're not, Turner Classic Movies is a, a, you know, run by a corporation. This is, they're, they're not, uh, it's not a scholastic publication. <laughs> so th they must have known, they, did they have a feeling uh, and did you have a feeling that there's an audience for this book? You know, we didn't really talk about the specifics because the book, as far as I knew, was already kind of greenlit at that point. So I'm assuming they did internal metrics that prove that there was a readership for this. For me, you know, I definitely think that there is a, you know, a subset of, of people, a very large group of people, you know, that, that do love reading as much as watching movies. You know, it's just a question of like, how do I get into that? How do I have the time for that? You know, time is always a big factor devoting yourself to a, a book as opposed to watching like a two and a half hour movie and so I you know I, that was a big thing for me in terms of picking what I picked because I was like somebody's gonna have to take time out of their day to actually want to read something and I should probably pick books that are worth worth taking that time out you know um I wrote it ironically during the pandemic uh you know so I think that if anything, you know, there was a lot more open desire to read, you know, and I hope that that's continued. But I do think that TCM's audience, you know, especially, I mean, are, are people that that not, not only have a great love for old Hollywood, but are also, you know, into literature or at least wanting to see how the sausage gets made, you know, and, and part of that is reading a book and finding out why a director would take out a, a subplot or add in a character or something like that. Right. Well, it seems, you know, uh, reading seems to be in and has been, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, 
book reading has gone up even before the pandemic, but the pandemic has really kind of sealed the deal that people are more interested in reading. And this is sort of a service book uh, to, to a, a, a type of person that, as you said, loves reading and also loves old Hollywood. Um, now, uh, specifically, what, you know, there have been uh, obviously, um, God, you, you know, uh, I have some notes here. James Jones, Michael Crichton, Henry James, uh, Jane Austen, of course, we mentioned um, the Bible. You know, there have been a lot of books uh, turned into movies, some great, uh, some maybe better than the actual books themselves. Uh, some actually, um, or, you know, some disasters, of course. Um, what are some of your uh, favorite books uh, that you really uh you know, love up in your book that have been, that were turned into movies? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was really hard because I had to not think of just myself. Uh, and that's kind of the joke is that a lot of people that know me have asked like, well, how many books did you like biasly throw in? And I was like, I couldn't actually include a lot of like the stuff that some of my favorites, because A, either they weren't like commercial successes, B, the book is not really well known, the movie's not really that great, you know, so I had to really kind of appease a, a wide swath of people, you know, TCM wanted diversity in terms of the authors, as did I, you know, I didn't want to just put a list of like, you know, white cishet male writers, you know, in this, uh, as well as movies, so I had to really kind of be judicious in terms of picking the amount of people, you know, in terms of not having too many of one genre, not having too many dudes, not having too many. I think the only thing that I keep kicking myself that I did not do is I tended to stick to America, uh, at least at least American movies as opposed to foreign. Um, I, I have a couple of foreign authors, but the movies are, are either American or British. Um, mostly that was because of time and because I was not thinking of some of the great, you know, foreign adaptations that we've had, like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or, or Let the Right One In. So if I ever get a book two, I will rectify that, I promise. Um, so what is your same, favorite, what would be your favorite uh, uh, Jane Austen uh, uh, redo or movie version? Oh my gosh. I mean, I put, I put, um, I put Clueless in there, you know, which is based off of Emma. Um, so that's, that's a big one for me, uh, which I love that one. You know, the the one that I always say is kind of like the one that I knew non-negotiably was not, but was going to be in it was Wuthering Heights, which is Emily Bronte, which is my favorite book. So I knew it, that was one that I wrote the sample chapter for, sold the book. I knew it was going to be included. Uh, sure. That was like non-negotiable. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> old, like, had one non-negotiable title that they wanted included. They wanted Dune because that was what was the, their big film at the time I was writing it. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. Um, but other now, than which that, which team did you look at the, uh, the, the version or, or both or the TV? Um, I, looked at the, I looked at the one that came out last year. Gotcha. Yeah. So the modern, yeah, the, the modern one, I do touch a little bit on the, the Lynch, uh, one as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, it was kind of like the sky is the limit. So I tried very hard to kind of pick authors that people knew books that people knew, uh, mo clearly movies that people knew, movies that maybe they didn't remember that there was a book. You know, people tend to forget that like Spielberg's three biggest films, you know, Color Purple, uh, Jurassic Park, Jaws. I mean, maybe, you know, Color Purple is based on a book, but, you know, Jaws, a lot of people forget Ben Shelley's novel in there. Um, so a lot I, of I the tried... 70s movies, like, uh, you know, The Godfather and French Connection, I think. And... Yeah, The Godfather is in there. Yeah, I definitely. So I definitely knew I had to include some of the big hits. Uh, you know, Hunger Games is in there. So I knew <laughs> I, there were a lot of a lot of people I had to appease other than just myself, because I tell people this had just been based off of books and movies I love. It would have been a very, very different, shorter list, probably. Um, I think my long list was about a hundred movies, and then I eventually we kind of talked it talked it down and settled on on fifty two, which I'm still shocked that I picked that high number. Well, that's you know that's amazing, and well, that sounds like there could be a sequel, obviously, and and maybe even uh, you said you love uh, films based on or you love uh, mystery novels, and uh, that's a whole um, you know Mickey Spillane and and. Yeah. Uh, were there any movies there that uh, that 
that you sh uh, give a shout out into the book that were really loyal and good uh, versions of the books that you loved? Oh gosh, I mean, I, I definitely, I love Jurassic Park in the sense that you can watch Jurassic Park as a film and love it, but you can also read the book completely separate and love it just as much. You know, I, oh. I think Michael Crichton's book is just as fantastic as the film which is not, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, what you get. Um, you know, Wuthering Heights, I, I love it in spite of the fact that most of the movies do not do the whole book. Uh, most movies only do like maybe the first like 20 chapters, uh, mostly because it's very confusing to have all the characters with the same names. Um, so, so I definitely have ones where, you know, I love the book as much as I love the film. Um, you know, and there were definitely examples of, things where I was like, oh, I love the movie, but the book kind of sucked. Um, that I didn't include mostly because I didn't want to have to kind of grouse about how bad the book is. Well, it's, you know, I was just going to say, uh, is it uh, Judith Guest that wrote Ordinary People? Do I have I that right? so. Anyway, the, the movie, I mean, the book is fine. It reads like a lifetime movie, you know, but, for its, but uh, and it's, you know, affecting, but but the movie just it has a lot of impact. And of course, uh, it, it, are there films that uh, the imagery alone, uh, uh, the director has chosen that, you know, blows away the, the, the book? Well, there's certainly ones where I understand the changes they make and I, I love them in spite of the change. So like Rebecca is a great example. You know, Hitchcock really makes a fantastically beautiful romantic film but you also have to lose a lot of the sexuality and specifically like the LGBTQ reading that you would get with a character like Mrs. Danvers that you couldn't do in 1940. And Ben Wheatley tried to do a little bit of that in the 2020, uh, what is it, 2016, 20, or whatever the one with, um, with uh, Lily James was, and it also didn't work. Um, so I, I mean, I definitely think that's, that's a really good one, um, you know, stuff that didn't I, virgin suicides i think is a really good one too where you know sofia coppola translates uh jeffrey eugenide's book so well you know the book does read very interesting but it can be a little cold to read you know it, which is ironic because sofia coppola pretty much adapts that movie verbatim you know she lifts large swaths of the text and there's very little that's different between the two yet her ability to kind of infuse more of a feminist lens to it and more of a, a pop pastel palette to it really does elevate it in a different way to the book. Um, you know, the same with like something like the Coens with No Country for Old Men, which again is pretty much verbatim, you know, right down to the dialogue. It's wow. the same I didn't know as that. Cormac. <laughs> yeah. As, um, but Cormac McCarthy's book, I, I tend to say is angrier. You know, there's a lot more frustration and a lack of empathy for humanity, I think, than the Coens who kind of do that, but kind of give it that little twist, that Cohen like um, ethical twist that they usually do with their crime dramas. So- Well, I'm yeah, sure a lot of uh, Hollywood directors have put a happy ending on a, on a, on a you know, a novel that uh, ends with like everybody dead. <laughs> Uh, now I want to open it up. If if our if our uh, attendees can unmute, I'd like to uh, open it up to members asking questions. Um, but I do wonder who do you think is the most uh, unfilmable author? And then we'll get to Michael uh, after after that, and we'll talk about uh, his process as well and his book about the Oscars. Yeah, I mean, I everybody I to... unmute themselves. Just, sorry, Kristen, just. Everybody unmute, but yeah, that's my question to you, the question. final question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I really did think about like books that would could never be translated to film because because in doing a lot of the writing for the book, I heard that a lot, you know, like Lord of the Rings. They thought they could never translate it to, to film. It would never work. So, and clearly in some instances, you know, unfilmable books do end up filmed for better or for worse. Um, you know, the one that I know... I know a lot of people bring up, and I, I would agree that it is probably unfilmable, I, but I would love to see the effort made. Um, I read it in college. It's Mark Danielewski's House of Leaves, which is a very, very interesting uh, kind of like haunted house, maybe, type of story. But the way that it is written 
is he's also kind of upending the process of writing. So the words will like go around the page, you know, or they'll be written backwards, oh, you know. So, and it's that very, it's visual. Very, yeah, it's a very fascinating story, but you're like, how do you translate that? Um, you know, I mean, I don't know, Noah Baumbach could try to do it, you know, kind of, it's very much like, I think I read it in the same class as White Noise. So I don't want him to, but he could try. Um, but I, I think that that's one, the one I always go to where I'm like, if we're talking about unfilmable, when you're actually deconstructing the process of how to write a book and how we read a book, I don't really think that'll translate to film. Right, right. Uh, okay, well, hey, Valerie Ettenhofer, do you have a, a, a question for Kristen? Sure. Um, I was curious, just because you said the process of, uh, maybe you can't talk about it yet, but you were talking about doing a second book where getting it sold was a lot different. Um, how, I don't know, what, what was the contrast there and how did you go about um, knowing that you did it this one way that kind of um, maybe, you know, was a little bit easier and then going on to the next, next way of selling your book? Yeah. I of it is because TCM knows me you know and so I already have that relationship with them they know I they knew I could write it was more of a process of like can you do the formal book thing um you know now in what I'm working on you know where the idea is wholly original you know and they're I, you know you I it's really a process of like looking at the book landscape and finding uh comparable titles that say hey this book is going to sell mm -hmm. um you know, and, and trying to get people that don't know me at all to think that I can write an original book that maybe will sell, hopefully, you know, so there's a lot more attempts to please strangers uh, that is that is far, far harder. And you're also having to look at like, what can I sell this as, you know, this idea that maybe nobody's written about it, but I have to find comparable titles that prove that it is marketable. Um, and okay. that requires, you know, kind of doing your own due diligence with marketing and, and all of that. So uh, I haven't struck goal yet, but I maintain that, you know, uh, I think it's just a, a right, it's a timing thing, you know, so maybe, maybe when the book, is, this book is actually out, you know, things will be different, but it's, it was a far cry from just having one person at TCM be like, would you send us this? And we'll pretty much just do whatever you want. Right. Well, that would be the dream for, I think, anybody. Yeah. Um, uh, Maria, do you have a question for Kristen? Uh, sure. I mean, actually, I have a question that could go for um, either of our authors. It's pretty mercenary, but I'll ask it. Um, I'm an academic primarily, and I've written two books with uh, academic presses and edited a third and have recently written a book that is um, also a university press published book, but very much aimed at a more general audience um, of cinephiles and or LGBTQ uh, film fans. And so that's, you know, my trying to kind of transition into more of that kind of writing going forward. Academics don't have to um, have agents to get academic books published. We deal directly with the university press. So, um, my question for you is, how does one go about getting an agent to write a book for a more crossover audience and a trade press? Yeah, I mean, in my experience, again, uh, you know, it was kind of who I knew. I knew a friend who had a book label and he knew a guy who was an agent. Uh, so I kind of just met met with him and we signed a contract, um, you know, but but I got it after this book was already written. So he didn't get, he didn't get any profit off of this, um, which I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing for him. Um, but, you know, the hope for, for at least him is that, you know, well, if this book does well, then the next book we can, we can do something, you know, that will benefit him. Uh, you know, so again, in my, in my instance, it was very easy, you know, and I know people say, you know, don't sign with the first person that shows up. Um, you know, and in my case, I was like, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm ever going to write another book. You know, I don't necessarily want to look for somebody. So like, I got this guy if I ever decide to do it again. Um, so, so my motivations for doing it, I think were, are, are, were very different. Um, and it was very much, you know, knowing another author um, who had worked with agents and being like, well, who do you know? Uh, and having that's like it is in, in, in Hollywood if you're a screenwriter, I guess. But yeah. there are also smaller publishers where 
if you have a good idea and a proposal, uh, they might say you don't need an agent or you just might not. Yeah. If, if, if you look at a publisher, you know, the type of stuff that they've already, uh, you know, what they put out. And if it's in their wheelhouse and you have something sort of special and you present yourself as an expert on the topic, I would think that they would be open to, you know, discuss discussion. Um, Kenneth or, or uh, Josh, do you have any a question for Kristen? Josh, you're on mute. Oh, Kenneth, um, do you have one? I have one if you don't. Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Kristen, is there any movies that you, as you were like approaching them for your list, sorry if you've already said this, I showed up about 10 minutes late. Um, or is there any movies that you were like, oh, wow, I thought this was a book? Because like, I know like at least two Whit Stillman books were turned in, or movies were turned into books after they were movies. And like sometimes Wes Anderson movies have like a really book-like quality. Was there anything that you encountered like that? No, if anything, my biggest challenge was more novellas versus actual books. Um, I assumed a lot of, uh, a few titles were actual novels and it turned out that they were actually either short stories or novellas and thus I couldn't include, I kind of cheated on at least two though. Um, mm -hmm. I have Passing and Coraline in my book, which are both typically considered novellas, uh, but I, I included them. Um, but like, I really wanted to do Stand By Me, but that is actually a short story in a Stephen King collection. So uh, I could not include it. Um, so that was more of what I would run into was stuff where I was like, that's a full like 200 page book. And they're like, no, it's actually like 15 pages. <laughs> Once upon a time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino yeah. uh, put out a book afterwards uh, 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 and added to it and uh, no no thank you no I, I also didn't include novelizations which was another thing that I ran into where I was like you know like Men in Black has a novelization I'm like oh sure. but that's or, actually or written in conjunction books. yeah I'm like that's written in conjunction with the film so that really doesn't count so I did run into that a couple times where you know popular movies where I was like oh like Outbreak, Devil's Advocate. Sure. Those are all yeah, based on the movie, based on yes. the Columbia Pictures. Yes. Hit, you know. uh, <laughs> Where I was you like, know. it would still be cool to kind of include them, uh, you know, because they do sometimes differ from the the source, the actual film. But I did yeah. not think in good conscience we could include them, so I did not. They're probably boiled down screenplays. Uh, okay, now uh, Michael. Welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, Michael, I'm just wondering if, if I can ask a question for you, or maybe you have a question for Kristen, as, and then we'll say to, to you uh, about the, the best or worst Oscar winners based on a, 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 a book. Well, um, I was thinking about this as Kristen was talking, and um, one of my favorite movies that is based on a book that I think is worse than the movie is uh one flew over the cuckoo's nest oh um, you know I, I just i just love that movie and one of the chapters in my book is about the 1976 oscar uh, best picture race which it was actually up against two other movies based on books jaws and barry Lyndon, uh the kubrick movie um and uh you know i I think I think when Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest is a masterpiece. When you read the original Ken Kesey novel, it's it's very energetic and it's a sort of a product of its time. You know, it's it's very um, uncomfortably sexist and racist, and you know, it's like some of it's just it's dated in ways that are not so great. And I think some of that persists into the movie, um, but I think the movie really improves on it. And a character like Nurse Ratchet, who's uh, a kind of um, you know, evil harpy monster in uh, in the book, and the, the way she's described is so kind of graphic and gross. Um, Louise Fletcher brought so much shading to that part, and so much subtlety, and kind of understood how to make that character more interesting and more insidious by making her a little gentler and placid on the surface, but then, of course, being a master manipulator underneath. Now, did she win an Oscar for that? She did actually. Um, was that a dishy race? Was it competitive? Tell us about Louise's uh, R.I.P. to Louise Fletcher. She just I passed know, away. I know. You know, actually, I did a, a piece about her right before I started this book in 2018 or so. Uh, I wrote about her for uh, Vanity Fair and spent a long time talking to her in her uh, at her home in L.A. 
and just thought her wow. story was incredible. You know, she was born to deaf parents uh, in Alabama, and uh, you know, she grew up in segregated Alabama. Um, her her father was a preacher who preached to deaf congregations, and he sort of made a point to uh, preach to black congregations as well. And um, when she was trying to figure out how to play Nurse Ratchet, one of the revelations she had that she told me was that she thought about her upbringing in, in the South and how the white people in the South like always had this sort of patronizing friendly tone that they used to black people like, oh, we're helping you, like we're sort of accommodating you, but it was sort of this surface level kindness. And um, it was actually, of course, incredibly cruel underneath. Um, and so she sort of brought that in, into Nurse Ratchet, you know, the way Nurse Ratchet um, sort of says, oh, let's go around and tell us about your problem. And it was, it's not, it's not like monstrous on the surface. So uh, it's much more effective that way. Um, you know, I found her totally fascinating. Um, but basically that movie won the big five, it won best picture, best actor, best actress, uh, best director, and best, uh, adapted screenplay in that case. It's one of three movies that has done the big five. The first was It Happened One Night in, uh, in 1935. The second was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And the last one was Silence of the Lambs. So um, anyway, that so, so, so the, that chapter in the book is sort of about how these five movies in 1976 um, kind of got made and how they all sort of collided at the Oscars. That was a classic uh, era. The uh, it just seemed like the movies that were winning Oscars in the '70s were movies that were really about what is going on in the world today uh, or then. You know, were much more topical. Um, so, uh, tell me about you as a as a kid and your your how you fell in love with the Oscars. Sure. Well, I have a pretty clear memory of the first Oscars that I watched. Uh, it was 1993. I was 12 or 11. And um, it was it was the era of the Billy Crystal medley. And because I know exactly what medley I watched when I first watched the Oscars, it was the one with like Unforgiven and the crying game. Um, and I was too young to have seen any of these movies, but I just thought this was like the funniest comedy I'd ever seen. Billy Crystal doing, you know, his shtick. Um, and I love the sort of in-jokes, like he makes an in-joke about, you know, a, a few good men, why is the director not nominated? And it's like that kind of insider Hollywood humor, I just instantly fell in love with um, and just started watching the Oscars every year after that. Now, do you, are, are you like me? I, I, uh, I noticed somebody recently tweeted about how they really want the Oscar producers to go back to showing the nominees sweating it out, like the, a, a close up on them, you know, as their names are being read. That, that to me is one of the, the, the big, you know, the, one of the big fun reasons beyond, I guess, the fashion for a lot of people, uh, you know, to see that, that Oscar war, if you will, uh, play out. You know who's going to win? I do, I do love when actors have clearly practiced their losing face, like the, <laughs> you know, and you occasionally have someone who just can't contain their disappointment, and they, you know, or makes right. some stick out of it, like Jackie Hoffman. I think when she lost an Emmy, she just went. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what to you is the is the the sort of most unknown volatile. Uh, Oscar battle, and w without getting into Harvey Weinstein that era, but uh, you know, known. yeah, that's everyone knows about that. Um, well, so one of the ones that I devoted a whole chapter to that I really love. This is like a forgotten Oscar scandal. Was from 1957, when um, Deborah Carr came out and she presented a, a, a category that does not exist anymore, which is Best Motion Picture Story. Hmm. <laughs> It went to someone named Robert Rich for a movie called The uh, the Brave One, which is about a Mexican boy and his pet bull, and he's trying to save the bull from going into the matador's ring and be slaughtered. Um, so she reads, the winner's Robert Rich. Robert Rich isn't there. Someone comes up and takes it for him. And then nobody can find this guy. It's like he's this imaginary phantom winner, Robert Rich. Um, the producers say they met him and 
Munich years ago and bought a story off of him and don't know where he is. Um, one of the producers actually had a nephew named Robert Rich, but he said, oh, well, I'm not this guy who wrote the screen. I'm a different Robert Rich. So How random. random. And so Hollywood was kind of enveloped in this who won it, as Life Magazine put it. Um, and Life actually asked the producers to describe this guy, and they included an illustration of what Robert Rich might look like. <laughs> you know, aquiline nose, parted hair, uh, you know, yay high. Um, as it turned out, Robert Rich was a front name for a blacklisted screenwriter, namely oh. Dalton Trumbo. Oh, so that makes Dalton, sense. Dalton Trumbo had been living in self-exile in Mexico and went to a bullfight and got this idea, sold this uh, idea to uh, the producers, the King brothers, and it got made into this movie, but they, they slapped their nephew's name on it, and, but then it won an award. And so once you kind of scratch the surface of this scandal, you get the entire saga of the blacklist playing out in a very particular way. And so that same year, 1957, um, there was a movie called Friendly Persuasion, which is about Quakers during the Civil War. It's a Gary, <laughs> Gary Cooper movie. It has um, uh, a young Anthony Perkins. It's not great, but you know, it's there. It, so it was based on a, a, a memoir, another movie based on a book. Not, neither is particularly esteemed, um, but it was based on the book and it was written by um, a, a writer named Michael Wilson, who by that point had been blacklisted as well. And so they released it with no credit for a screenwriter because the, the guild said, we can't credit the real writer, the producers didn't, uh, we can't credit, we can't credit the sort of fate, phony writer that they wanted to credit, the woman. Alan Smithy? Yeah, the, the, um, the producers wouldn't credit the blacklist guy, Michael Wilson. So they just released it with nobody. It just said, based upon the book by Jessamyn West. Um, but then this caused a problem for the Academy because it got nominated. It was about to get nominated very likely for best adapted screenplay. And yet it didn't have accredited writer. It was like the only movie that had ever been released with you know no, uh, uh, no writer. So because of that, the Academy um, instituted a rule saying, basically, if you're blacklisted, you, you can't be nominated for an Oscar. So this movie was uh, nominated and disqualified in the same day. Wow. And so the Academy had officially joined the blacklist. But then on the night of the awards, that's when Robert Rich won, you know, this phantom man. And so what Trumbo did is he kind of used this whole press brouhaha to his advantage to turn the tables on the Academy and Hollywood and try to undermine the blacklist. So he, he started giving interviews where he would say, well, I don't know, I might be Robert Rich, it might be my friend Robert Wilson, who knows? You know, and he actually, he sent in a poem to Life Magazine sort of teasing, where's Robert Rich? Come back or Robert Rich, wherever you are. Do you live on the moon? Do you live on a star? You know, he, just had, he had fun with it. And he kind of created this idea that Robert Rich is sort of the unknown artist who stands for all these blacklisted people who are working on the blacklist. Um, he gave a speech where he said, Robert Rich has as many faces as the blacklist itself. Wow. And just kind of played the press, played the hype. Uh, and two years later, the Academy finally overturned their rule. They rescinded this rule against blacklisted nominees because they just found it unworkable. They were, you know, Bridge on the River Kwai had this, uh, another obvious one at one best screenplay, best adapted screenplay, but it was credited to the French writer of the book, Pierre Boulle, who didn't even really speak English. So it was just, it turned into a farce. And Trumbo used all of this to kind of like play the press and, um, and try to end the blacklist. Now, the end of the story is that of course, famously Trumbo was the first screenwriter to break through the blacklist in 1960 with the movies Exodus and Spartacus. He actually got his name on it. And when you think about the scene in Spartacus, the most famous scene, what is it? I am all the soldiers saying, I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus to protect Spartacus. That idea is so similar to what he said about Robert Rich, this imaginary, this pseudonym. He said, right, Robert right. Rich has as many faces as the blacklist itself. So yeah. I sort of found these really fascinating connections. And I have a chapter on the, him and two other screenwriters who were writing and who were winning Oscars for screenplays that they couldn't actually take credit for. 
That's beautiful. I mean, just when you think the Oscars don't have that much to do with uh, society at large. <laughs> um, now, uh, getting kind of uh, dishy, what about uh, what we had with the uh, Andrea Riceboro? I'm not yeah. sure if I'm saying her name correct correctly, but uh, uh, Oscar historians such as yourself have, have brought up uh, you know, past uh, kerfuffles. I, I guess Betty Davis, uh, there was a write-in campaign. Is that in your book? There, it, it certainly is. This is kind of the first snub, which was 1935. Um, Betty Davis had been in Of Human Bondage, yet another movie based on a book by uh, Somerset Maugham. And, uh, you know, it's like a classic. It was one of her big sort of like bitch roles. Like she was just this nasty character. And um, when the nominations came out, she wasn't on the best actress list. It caused an uproar in Hollywood. Um, actors started complaining and people started questioning the legitimacy of the awards. And this was a very tender moment for the Oscars because um, the guilds were all fighting with the Academy over labor relation issues. And it, it was not guaranteed that the Oscars would continue. Mm, so, wow. Um, and now their awards are being called into question. So the Academy opened the awards up to um, writing campaigns for the first time. And suddenly that opened the door for every studio to organize writing campaigns for whoever their big stars were, their big movies. You know, it sort of turned into this factionalism thing. Um, nevertheless, Betty Davis did not win. That was the year of It Happened One Night. And as we talked about earlier, it was a sweep. So Claudette Colbert won Best Actress. And Betty Davis actually won the next year for Dangerous. She won her first Oscar for this movie that even she thought was terrible. Um, I don't think it's that bad, but she thought she should have won for Of Human Bondage. And this was just a kind of uh, consolation prize a year after the fact, which I think still happens all the time. Interesting. I wonder, uh, what, uh, what was the, the movie in which she, she, was it The Star, where she played a star who won an Oscar? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that was based on a book. Um, okay, I'm going to no, open it up to... Uh, there couldn't possibly have been a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after the fact. Um, okay, well, uh, who would like to answer, uh, ask uh, Michael a question about his book, uh, Oscar Wars? Um, please unmute yourselves if you haven't, and just uh, jump in there, or I will just uh, call on you. But Maria, do you have a question? Um, I would reiterate my earlier question uh, to Michael, but um, I don't know. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are as well about the uh, what I believe to be the beloved um, montage sequences that Chuck Workman, I think that's his name, did for the Oscars. How do you feel about the history of those? <laughs> do you know them? You mean the obituary? I mean the uh, saying. No, goodbye. no, they they we haven't seen them in several years. I'm not even sure he's still alive. But he made these montage sequences that would oftentimes, you know, be featured uh, in the Oscar ceremonies. He may well have done the obits, but I'm not thinking about those specifically. Um, I was reminded of it because you were talking about Billy Crystal's uh, medleys, and I feel like it was kind of overlapping in the same run of years there. But yeah, if you're not recalling them. No, 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 I, like when they would do like every every great uh, scene uh, in like New York City, like that the themed ones. Right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, I always loved those, you know? Mm -hmm. It's funny, I was thinking about those when I saw Babylon because the end of Babylon, mm -hmm. not to give, you know, spoiler alert, but there's something that's sort of about the grand history of the movies and it, it felt to me like one of those old Oscar montages sort of in a bad way that's not sort of not how I wanted Babylon to to end um mm -hmm. but you know I did always love those I don't know much about the, the history of them specifically um and to your earlier question about agents I don't know if this is at all helpful it probably isn't I mean I met my agent through my job at the New Yorker because he's someone who works with a lot of New Yorker writers and so I had met him sort of socially and then he um asked me for a meeting and we kind of brainstormed, like, what do I have a book that I would write? And he started to ask me what interests you, what interests you? And the first few things he was like, no, there's already a book coming out about that, forget it. And when I said Meryl Streep, he was like, there we go. Um, and he kind of helped me shape the idea. My first book, Her Again, Becoming Meryl Streep, is, um, is specifically about her 20s and her coming of age and rise to fame in the 1970s. So it kind of 
starts with her high school college years and ends with her winning the Oscar for Kramer versus Kramer. And what my agent David Kuhn uh, wisely said was like, you don't have to do a whole biography of Meryl Streep that will take you forever and be a thousand pages long. Think of a story that you can tell about her. And the story I wanted to tell was that sort of like, who was she before she was this queen of all acting? You know, how did she get that, make that journey? Interesting, and, because we want to know who she is because she is so good at playing other people, but we don't know her. Yeah, and also, you know, that period of her life uh, is very eventful. Um, for one thing, it's it covers her uh, romance with John Cazale, the great actor known for playing Fredo in The Godfather and, and several other roles in the New Hollywood. Um, and he, you know, they were a very unlikely couple. Uh, they met doing Shakespeare in the park and then they were in the deer hunter together. And shortly after that he died and she was at his bedside. So I knew there would be a kind of tragic love story at the center of the book. So, um, and then, and then, you know, when we, we pitched the book around and um, Harper Collins bought it. And then also part of the contract was a sort of first look at my next book idea. And that was this. Um, although when I first went to, went to them, it was more of a, it was a smaller idea about like the making of a single movie. And they said, we want you to think big, do something big, make a statement. And so I came up with this Oscar idea where it would be about a dozen chapters, each one a, a deep dive into a certain year or category or, or, or war of some kind in the history. Um, and, you know, as you can see, they got a big book. It's, you know, Wow, that's gigantic. <laughs> took me four years, uh, you know, came in 14 months late and uh, and quite long, but, you know. Interesting, 14 they months late. Me, they did ask me to think big, and I, I, I sort of felt the time, well, you know, it's it's not every day someone asks you to be more ambitious and, like, take on a bigger fight, so I might as well do that. That's, that's great. Uh, Kenneth, do you have a question for Michael? Well, yeah, it sounds really interesting. I mean, your book sounds totally up my alley. And I was wondering, was there any sort of pressure for you to focus primarily on what, like what maybe young people or a younger market would know about the Oscars? Or were you free to go back, you know, way to the beginning for some of the earlier scandals, like with Diana Ross or Chill Wills? No, I didn't get any sort of pressure to do anything, you know, and it really covers it starts in, in year one, 1929, and you know the founding of the Academy in the silent era. And you know just the way it's structured, I wanted to have at least one story for each decade, but I didn't want to cover every single year. You know, those kind of books exist, the sort of yearbook, encyclopedic guide to who won, who lost, what records were set, et cetera. You know, I really wanted to be story driven, like narrative and narrative driven. Um, and then I just went through all of Oscar history, all nine and a half decades of it, and sort of picked the juiciest years. Um, the last one is the Moonlight La La Land year and sort of the aftermath of Oscar So White. And I had written a, a long New Yorker piece about that already, which is sort of how the book originated. Um, and then at the very, very end, I turned it in last February to the editor, and I wasn't quite happy with the afterward, the conclusion. And then I went to the Oscars and the slap happened. And I was like, all right, uh, I have to put this in and I, ha I have a new ending, <laughs> you know, which is, you know, bringing us up through the slap. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it really, it really covers every era. And that's, that's really what took so long is that I felt like I really mm -hmm. needed to, to learn everything I could about each era before I told my story, which is kind of a little microcosm you know, like in order to tell the story of these three blacklisted screenwriters, I, I had to read a bunch of books on the blacklist in general and just really get the lay of the land and, and become an expert on it. And then sort of learn about, you know, how did, how did Dalton Trumbo, Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson sort of get through this, you know, fraught period of their lives. And not to belabor the point, but that is uh, something that we might be uh, might be forced to deal with soon again, something like that. Uh, Josh, did you have a question for Michael? Yeah, um, I know that in like the, you know, 20, um, this century, and then especially in the last few years, they've renamed the best foreign film to best international film. Um, but even before that, there has been, you know, an influx of, um, you know, 
like Mexican directors winning and whatnot. And I'm curious, you know, even before this relatively recent public push to have to include more of the international filmmaking community in the academy how much involvement was there already before there was sort of a public campaign was there a good contingent there or or was it really a small amount well yeah i mean i think an underappreciated part of this diversity initiative coming after oscar so white was that they expanded a lot of their international membership and i think that accounts for um, a win like Parasite, you know, it, it seems like even this year, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front is nominated not just for Best International Picture, but for Best Picture, and it has nine nominations, you know, it's, um, so I do think, I do think the Academy has gotten palpably more international and less sort of Hollywood centric. It's interesting mm -hmm. to go back in, in, in history and see how, how it began. It was so clubby. It was so centered around the, the major studios. You know, it was the brainchild of Louis B. Mayer at the whole of the Academy. And the intrusion of, you know, foreign films. I mean, I, I think Olivier's Hamlet was nominated and, and won in the, in the late forties. And that, it, that caused like so much Sturm und Drang, you know, like you'd think you know, that a foreigner, you know, Laurence Olivier was butting into the Oscars. It seems so silly now, you know, like we, we English people winning awards is like a no brainer now, but- And Othello. I'm oh, sorry? You said Othello? Was it? Sorry, oh. um, I, well, I, yeah, it's, I mean, no, I think this was his Hamlet. Um, Hamlet, sorry. Hamlet, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, so it just, Every time the Oscars has expanded in some way, you know, it sort of causes these these growing pains. And I think it's honestly it's so great right now that that they have that it's it's less American centric. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what about you, Valerie? Do you have a question for Michael? Sure. Um, I've noticed that I feel like with award season, everyone wants to. There's there's a a love for the stats and the records being broken, right? And talking about that. But I think with that, there's always a bit of, um, people get a little ahistorical as well sometimes. Um, I was wondering if you have any specific uh, common misconceptions or sort of like misreported things, things that we say are unprecedented that aren't or anything like that, that, that kind of is your, your pet peeve that you see a lot. One that comes to mind, but I think people are, have been acknowledging it this year. You know, this year there's a, a incredible number of um, Asian nominees, and um, you know, like Michelle Yeoh, all the all the everything ever everywhere at once. People, Hong Chow in the Whale. Um, weirdly, uh, if you if you're starting to talk about first with Asian nominees or people of Asian descent, you have to acknowledge Merle Oberon, who hid her ancestry. Oh, yeah. and passed as as white when she had uh, one of her parents was from Ceylon now Sri Lanka um, you know she, uh, this isn't covered in my book but it's it's really fascinating the story of Merle Oberon passing as a white British woman um, so that that comes to mind but I you know I don't I haven't seen people getting it wrong it's just like an interesting thing like if you acknowledge the firstness of things you have to go way back to this other era to this very weird story um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I mean, this is a pet peeve, but uh, it has nothing to do with uh, records or anything, but people always misquote the Sally Field speech. She did not say, you like me, you really like me. She said, you like me right now, you like me. Oh, well, that's a big difference. I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, I love Sally Field. She's, uh, I just happened to read her, uh, her memoir that was, uh, it, it, it kind of like speeds up at the end and it's like so we're, we're at Sybil and then we're suddenly at Brothers and Sisters, which is odd. Um, so uh, I did did Lawrence Olivier get an Oscar nomination for Othello? I wonder. Well, that's good. <laughs> uh, okay, well, that that wraps up our uh, our first, our inaugural Gallica Authors Club. Thank you so much. To, is, is there, before we... Uh, say toodles, is there anything that uh, anybody wants to ask while they have the chance? I will just say that um, we could do a separate thing, uh, Kristen and Michael and I on on Barbara Stanwyck and the uh, the fact that she never got an Oscar 
and or except a uh, honorary one and the fountainhead not getting that and uh victoria wilson's book which is a doorstop even at the the um a doorstop or even at the just the first volume i mean the first edit the first half sorry the second half isn't here yet anyway i'm gonna shut up um anybody have a question that uh, the, a burning question before we go okay josh yeah this is for both of our guests um you know, both of you write for publications, uh, you know, full time. I'm wondering, how did you balance um, doing your job full time, but also researching, writing, and editing a book? That's a great question. Kristen? Yeah, in my, oh, go on. I don't know if I talked over somebody. No, sorry, you go. <laughs> um, yeah, well, in my case, you know, I hate to say that there's a silver lining to a pandemic, but in this case, uh, I ended up working from home, uh, which was a huge relief. I didn't have to worry about a commute. So I pretty much would write, um, cause it, it wasn't necessarily a research component. It was about making sure I had the time to read the books and watch the movies. So I, I usually had a schedule in terms of like, I had a week to read whatever I was reading. Um, and my Kindle and my iPad became the best way for me to speed read. Um, and I think the last two weeks of the year in December, uh, I actually thank them in my acknowledgments. Uh, I hold up at the Roosevelt Hotel here in LA um, and just kind of like Jack Torrance myself and did nothing but finish up the book and write. Um, so, so yeah, thankfully, you know, the the job I had at IndieWire was was far less demanding in the sense that like I wasn't necessarily uh, didn't have set hours. So it was more like I could make sure that at least my work was done and kind of once, you know, once the day was was close to ending could transition um, or at least have a movie on in the background while I was finishing something up. So working from home had, had benefits. <laughs> But that that still requires. I mean, what a lot of what a tremendous amount of discipline you both have. Michael, do you have a a thought? I won't lie. Um, it was hell. To, I you know I did both things at once, and it was really 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 hard. Um, I would have written the book a lot faster if I had taken a book leave, but I didn't. Um, uh, the New Yorker keeps me very busy, and I was sort of just becoming a staff writer in the middle of this, so. I didn't feel like I could just disappear on them and I didn't really want to. I sort of wanted to ride the momentum of, of, of my job there. So, you know, it was really, really difficult because when you're working on journalism, there's always something that is due that week or that day or that month. And you have to balance that with something that's due in three years. And it's so much harder to say, no, I am not going to do the short-term thing. I'm going to do the long-term thing. You know, I also, I always say that like, writing a article is sort of like swimming a lap and writing a book is like deep sea diving you know it takes <laughs> a long time to get down there for your body to adjust to the pressure it takes time to get out you know if you, you know how like if you scuba dive you, can, you have to sort of i've never scuba dived but join you know, the club you know if you like just go up really fast to the surface your pressure your body pressure is all messed up you know, writing a book, you have to have your whole mind immersed in it. And it's really hard to just switch from one to the other. You know, it's hard time in terms of time management, but it's also hard in terms of like your thought process. Um, right. The journey, like, you know, like the through line and, and you know, then you have to deal with, uh, not that I really know, but emails. I mean, that that that's a full time job these days sometimes just slogging through those. Um <laughs> Well, uh, wonderful. I just wanted to, uh, if our uh, attendees could just uh, say hi a little bit uh, and uh, uh, just their name and their outlet so that uh, whoever does watch this as we uh, head out knows who who were ask, who, who the people were asking questions. Valerie? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Valerie Ettenhofer. I write for Slash Film and Film School Rejects. Um, I'm the TV critic at Film School Rejects, and then I also do some news writing at Slash Film. Thank you. Kenneth? I'm Ken Anderson, and I write a blog, uh, Dreams of What Le Cinema is For. And it's amazing. It is just to talk about deep dives. Uh, you could put together, you've you you got some books in you. Uh, and, uh, because he's the same age. 
Oh, okay, got you. <laughs> Maria? I am, well, like I said, I'm an academic primarily, but um, I am also an editor of an academic journal called the New Review of Film and Television Studies. And I am a blogger as well. And my blog is called The Itinerant Cinephile. Nice. And Josh? I'm Josh Insinius. I write for Brooklyn Magazine and Movie Maker Magazine. Nice. And I, I would also like to have another uh, a podcast or, or, or talk about sometime, The Oscar, the movie with, um, oh, Stephen Boyd. And uh, I'm sure that if you haven't seen it, you've got to see it. It's uh, And it was based on a book, I found out. Uh, it's a camp fest. Uh, it's about a, a race for the Oscar, um, of course. And uh, I guess I'm just going to be quiet again. Anyway, thank you, everybody. This has been really wonderful. I so appreciate it. And uh, I hope that uh, we get this out there and a lot of people can hear what you had to say and the good questions. I really appreciate it. I think that this was a very uh, edifying and, and enjoyable panel. So thank you. Thank you.